And with that, I welcome all of you. Thank you so much for tuning in, for taking the time, for being here. You all have busy calendars, if not on a weekday, definitely on a weekend, but you're still here Saturday afternoon. For some, early in the morning, Nidhi is joining us from the US. Prerna is joining us from the UK. Uh, so I understand how uh, what this might have taken, but we appreciate your being here today. Because we are discussing an extremely important issue in the workplace. We are addressing the dearth of women in leadership. And our topic is we can only reimagine boardrooms with equal numbers of women if we redesign workplaces. Before I jump into what this entails, you know, getting your perspectives on it, for the benefit of our audience, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions. Thank you, dear women, for being here. Yeah, I hope that you will take away key pointers that which not just help you change your mindset, but also create that platform for women to find their way back to work such that they stay the course of their career and they have everything that they need to rise to what their potential already exists for. And to begin with, we have, uh, would be great if you would wave dear panelists, Nidhi Khatri, Brand Marketing and Growth Head at a New Age Early Stage Startup. Pregna Goyal, Co-Founder and COO at Clinic Cafe. Sumana Sarkar, Vice President and ESG Lead, Global Business Services, Bank of America. Chella Pandian Pichai, AVP, Global Head Talent, Learning, Leadership Development, Culture and DEI at Biocon, Biologics Limited. Sheetal Choksi, Founder and Director, Unpack Research Private Limited and World Hatter. Vino Jen Suklecha, COO, Consulting Engineers Group Limited. Yogita Vitale, Senior Solution Engineer, CSG. Bhuvana Subramanian, Senior Marketing Leader. Anupama Shivacharya, Calisthenics Coach and Freelance Journalist. And Rashmi Singh, Global Recruiting Operations Lead at Visteon. With that, it is a power pack table and we do have diversity present as well. Although the topic is discussing women in leadership, it's amazing and it's great that we will have uh, Mr. also uh, pitching in with his perspectives and his experience so far around this. So to begin with, uh, let me also ask our audiences to leave their questions in the chat or comment section so that we can take it up during or at the end of the session. My question to each and every one of you today at the table to begin with is, what is it that we need to redesign in workplaces, whether it is culture, policy, rules, etc., so that we can reimagine the scenario of having equal numbers of women in boardrooms at those C-suite levels, at those pivotal leadership levels, which have dismal numbers as of now. Uh, why don't we begin with you, Samana? Thanks, Kajal, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd say maybe, you know, if one had to answer it quite the way you phrased it, uh, what do we need to redesign? Maybe we need to redesign leaders uh, on one hand. I mean, I'm sure uh, a lot of uh, my co-panelists here who work on organization design, et cetera, will have many more inputs in terms of infrastructurally what needs to change at workplaces. But I think uh, since uh, this is about women in leadership, I'd say what we need to redesign is... Uh, leaders' mindsets, and if we can, uh, before the formal discussion, we were having a nice informal uh, tete tete when people were talking about uh, why is it that we're still talking on gender in 2022, and is that different across uh, cultures and geographies? So I would really say in terms of uh, what is the type of uh, support uh, women get? Yeah. Sorry, is, is that a ambient noise or maybe from one of the participants. But anyway, I'll go on. So yeah, I would really say uh, briefly, it is about uh, how leaders think, 
mm. what leaders look like so on one hand can we create more uh, role models uh, who look like or are representative of the leaders that we want to cultivate from among women and also uh, what you know what it takes to be one of the leaders so across cultures and geographies if more, not even more than 5% across fortune 500s are uh, women led boards or even women on boards i think a recent survey when they sliced the data it was like there are more than 50% boards with no women so clearly you know we are not meeting anything halfway uh, incremental is not good enough so perhaps similar to uh, what climate action now requires which is tectonic shift so we need something tectonic i wish i had the answer when i started uh, 20 years ago uh, i was the only women at many field places that perhaps were not uh, uh, you know considered safe or where one would see women 20 years later i'm in uh, boardrooms and quasi leadership forums where i'm the only woman uh, so uh, that's what i'd say so perhaps uh, something's not changing Oh, thanks so much for that, Samana. And uh, I'm guessing since you've seen, you know, that journey of 20 years, um, sadly, the, the scenarios haven't changed much. Uh, we're moving towards it, but uh, the effort it's taking to push the needle just a little bit is tremendous, right? So that's why. How else would we do this, Rashmi? Can we hear from you next? Yeah. So I think for me, my perspective on this is that it really starts with yourself first, right? Um, in terms of, you know, just we, just the way we shape the mindsets. And I think there, there are sometimes in terms of as women, um, there are a couple of, I guess, mind blocks or, uh, you know, the way we look at things, which itself becomes very gating in terms of, you know, just, just looking at all of this, right? And I feel in, in my experience in terms of, you know, working with women, um, having members in my team, I do feel there are, there are probably two or three things which I see um, women at times seem to do a lot more of, a um, couple of things, right? Like I think there's, there's a slight tendency of being this self-saboteur that you talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Where you know, constantly you, you try to have these thoughts or which sabotage, you know, your thinking and then you start thinking, okay, you start gets into, you know, a doubting kind of a phase. So just being, just, just you know, shutting out that self-saboteur kind of voice, right? That's one. The second I also feel is this constant need to excel in every role that one does, right? Uh, I want to be the best mom, I want to be the best daughter, I want to be the best wife, you know, best professional. And sure, there are days when you're successful in, you know, in some of them. And, so, and on some days, you really aren't, right? And I think it's okay. Like, just being okay with that, I feel sometimes, uh, you know, it takes a toll on you, right? Because you just, you just want to, you know, do that. Um, and the third thing I also feel, and, you know, I was having a conversation with one of my team members like long time back and uh, she she had a, a son who she was raising and I could see work was demanding. She was managing, you know, aging parents, her son, all of that. And I was just asking her that, you know, when do you have time for yourself? Like, you know, just focusing in terms of what you'd like. And she said, you know what? It really doesn't matter to me, right? If I see my son, you know, doing whatever he's, he's enjoying, and if I see, you know, and, and sometimes I think throughout that conversation, I also realized that there was a sense of guilt that she was also feeling if she was to take me time for herself, right? Like she loved to paint. And I said, why don't you get back to it, right? And she's like, no, but you know, then if I do that, that's at the cost of something else, right? So just this sense of, you know, a little bit of this guilt that, okay, if I take that time out also, something else will get impacted and that, you know, that level of guilt is, is really high. So to me, of course, there are lots of things we can do in terms of at a workplace, policies, internal, external. I do believe it starts with the self first and then all the other things, you know, uh, come into play because if that itself is not, uh, you're not working through that or building that awareness, at least that you're feeling all of that, 
um, then I think there's a bit of a challenge. So I would encourage everybody to kind of, you know, just, just think through that or reflect on that. Sure. Absolutely. Charity begins at home. So with that, I'd also just like to add to this question as to, yes, we, we have the self-work to do, uh, but having the patriarchal norms that we did for decades together, having the conditionings that we've all been through as women uh, in a society that's still having trouble, uh, you know, even giving an ad pass situation in situations in an outside of work. How would we do this? With that thought, maybe if you could also tackle the question of how do we design, redesign the workplace if we want equal numbers of women. Uh, can we hear from Vinu next? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for rising for uh, you know, organizing such a beautiful session. Um, continuing on the same thought as uh, you know, uh, Rashmi said that I think the, the, first and for, the first thing which we need to change is ourselves. You know, women as uh, women, we need to accept what we are and we need to accept that we, you know, we are not 100% perfect every time. You know, so it's okay to ask for help at times. It's okay to not be able to perform as per expectations of the society or we can say you know, the patriarchal society we live in. You know, so we need to come out of that boundary. You know, uh, everything is not falling in place as per your as per the family's or the boardroom's expectation, right? We need to feel confident that this is what this is. I mean, it, it, this is what uh, is going. And uh, until unless we are confident about our plannings, our decisions, we are not able to communicate that to the boardroom or even to the family. Okay, so we need to change our own mindset first. We need to feel confident. From, from our inner side, you know, we, we, we just can't go on, on work with just with a family pressure that, okay, I have to run back, I have to cook, I have to teach my kids, I have to do that, I, you know, I, and just because of that thought process, sometimes we are not even able to perform at work properly, you know, so we, we really need to come out of that boundary that we are not robots, you know, we can do mistakes, you know, and we can ask for help at times. And uh, probably at the, you know, if we talk about the organizations, yes, uh, I think the first and foremost uh, change, which as, uh, uh, as management we can br bring in is the flexibility in the working patterns. And, you know, uh, I'll share a very, uh, very small example. Like if we can allow our men who are working in our organizations to have small breaks, just to complete their family goals, like to pick up their kids or, you know, to have, to attend their uh, PTMs. Right. At least uh, if they can get involved in their family sessions or family, uh, you know, activities, the women from their families will not be able to, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, at least they will be able to continue with their jobs and uh, there will not be no reason for them to leave out from their jobs. So at least, you know, we need to provide a flexible working environment to our men as well so that they can cooperate to our women and our women can continue for their jobs. So. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that, Bini. Uh, Chela, can we hear from you? Thank you. I think it's great perspectives from all the leaders here. And uh, I personally feel being actively involved in creating women networks and being a part of women leadership development across multiple continents and countries. What I feel is uh, mindset is the biggest change that we need. And second, in the order of priority, one is the mindset. Second is creating an environment uh, which encompasses infrastructure, it encompasses culture. So all this I put under a bucket of environment, whether it is an organization or society or even at home. Third, the most importantly, do we have opportunities? And you may have an environment, you have the mindset, but how do we create opportunities? And so those are the three things which I have seen as uh, influencing factors for the balanced leadership, which we want to bring. And it's not about only in the boardrooms. Shala, we can't hear you very well. We do see uh, great 
imbalance across the level. Uh, sorry. No. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll come again. I'll, I'll fix this. Yeah, it was I'll, very patchy. I'll rejoin. It started off well, though, and then there was a lag yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, until we have Shala back, uh, Nidhi, can we hear from you? From me? Did I hear you? Yes, Nidhi. Let's hear from you. What do you think needs to be redesigned in the workplace so that we see those numbers of women at bar with men? Well, I guess uh, <clears throat> most of my co-panelists have very well said that Overcoming perfectionism is an internal battle that women go through. But when it comes to external challenges, Kajal, and given my journey, um, you know, after restarting and then reaching where I am today, the most important lesson that I have seen and I had to push boundaries was to the willingness to unlearn in organizations, willingness to unlearn the biases the beliefs and listen and give voice to the women leaders so that they can be part of the table. Sometimes I had to pull the chair and actually create that space for myself. So with that, I would say that advocating change and inclusivity is very important because that's how the top management communicates to the whole organization. Because it's right, you know, one of the co-panelists also highlighted to create the right role models. Now, if you look at the paradoxical mindset that women are fighting, you know, to create and be part of the table or sometimes create the table themselves, it's very important that they put their either they put their authentic self or they box themselves to be more acceptable in the society. So, you know, if you look at how Sanam Marin had come out saying that I am not apologetic of about being a true leader or being myself as a Finnish uh, Prime Minister, and she's given a great example to the young women out there that it's fine to go away and dance and enjoy with your friends. At the same time, I can also lead the country. So with that example, I think the obstacles and how the true women leaders are putting themselves out there is also giving visibility and voice, which is much, much required because that's where we are also creating visibility for women who are looking up to the young leaders of today. And with that, the most important point is that while we are fighting the paradoxical mindset, while we are fighting the willingness to unlearn, but at the same time, it's very, very important that we create more collective engagement for inclusivity. Because if you look at that, is how do you create that space for women or how do you create that visibility for leaders while you do you know some organizations do create you know when there is not right balance just so that they can get the ipo or they can put you know the right perspective for the structure but is that really correct because what's more important is the thought leadership and when is it the right time because with that thought leadership is where you set the right examples and you let the world or your organization or your policies filter through and penetrate through, you know, very deeply so that everybody in the organization can reverberate when, it, when we rightly say that, okay, fine, we have equitable opportunity. So with that, I would say that, you know, while women have to a very large extent uh, you know, they've been trying to balance the act. They've been trying to fight the internal battles. But the visibility and the collective engagement coming also for, from the external factors is very, very important. Oh, thanks, Nadia. I'm not sure if any of you heard the keynote this morning. It was a really powerful one by uh, uh, Anisha Singh. Uh, you know, the founder of She Capital. And I like what she said about, it's not just about top down, but it's also from the bottom to the top, right? It's only when you work both ways that you can actually iron out these equal numbers uh, of women in the workplace. Uh, Chala, do we have uh, 
Do you have good good audio now? Okay, great. So we'll be good yeah, to hear my, from my apologies. You. I'll try. I'm in a different place today, uh, but yeah. hopefully it says our connection is unstable. Uh, no problem. We, just give me about five minutes. I'll fix this. Oh yeah, sure. Not a problem. Uh, Anupama, why don't we hear from you? Uh, all right. So I think, I think uh, from my perspective comes from a freelance, right? So because I don't work for a company, my challenges uh, in terms of uh, having an equal number of women and men uh, is more uh, lucid. It's not exactly set. So uh, I think what changes need to come in place is that, that like, like Chela said, there needs to be a change in the mindset. And not just the mindset of women, it's mindset of men also, because fitness is so male dominated at the moment that a lot of male coaches, a lot of uh, male uh, fitness entrepreneurs want to support women. But it's not the first thought that comes to their mind that, hey, we need to bring a woman here. So to give you an example, we had a national level sport, no female judges. Even though there were female participants, there were no female judges. So I reached out to the, uh, you know, um, the organizers and said, hey, we have female participants. So why don't we have a female judge on the panel? So what happened is everyone acknowledged it. And I don't know, we are having a bit of audio issue with you. Can't, we lost you totally. Okay. Yeah, her screen froze, looks like. Yeah. Okay, and until Anupama comes back, Bhuvana, can we hear from you? Sure, Kajal. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, I think what we're hearing across the table is about this tokenism that's been existing, right? So I think we need, I mean, the policies need to start looking at that very seriously. It started off as a checkbox exercise to include women and women leaders, promoting them as part of that reservation quota in many, many organizations. And we've seen that happen over the years. I think that conversation, that narration has to definitely change in the boardrooms. And uh, for that, women have to, even if it's required forcefully, participate in those uh, policy changes and not settle for those very tiny you know, yeah, we'll include two women into this board or two women in this position. And, you know, just ask for what more are you going to do? What is that long-term plan in the organization to include women in, uh, you know, in the conversations, in the policy changes, and also ensure that it's a long-term, uh, there's a long-term vision uh, by the organization around this conversation. And it's also about, I, I'm not sure how many of us even, uh, are able to see the transparency in the opportunities that exist at that level at all. Like one woman, woman is called up and said, yeah, you've been performing and therefore you get to be this leader. Uh, but we do we know that five more opportunities exist in that level and we can bring in at least three more women to occupy that position? So there's no questioning or challenging that is happening. And this is visible in all our organizations. Uh, at this point in time, at least and it's changing. It, there is a consciousness around it and therefore it's good to see and definitely uh, it's much, much easier to change the narration in organization schedule vis-a-vis -vis the society. And yeah, of course it starts at home and uh, there are women who are questioning it at home also, uh, but that, that percentage is still tinier and the society is even lesser, uh, but it's much uh, in a controlled environment in organizations. And therefore, uh, I think uh, there is that conscious effort that is happening. It is definitely about considering and recognizing uh, to Nidhi's point that visibility creation around different perspectives and giving equal opportunities to women as well as empowering them to do their jobs effect efficiently. She, she might be a performer, but are you enabling her to become that leader? Uh, you know, and it's constant recognizing that she brings that diverse perspective, that emotional intelligence uh, that really women are uh, much, much better at. And it's, I mean, we all know many, many examples of that. 
uh, this is not this is not a contest between men and women. I think it's that needs to be very very clear. It's about empowering the right person for the right job. Of course, getting the right people on the bus. We are not here to tell. Uh, this is I'm saying from the women's side as well. It's not an entitlement because there is a policy creation. It's not an entitlement just because you're a woman. You don't automatically qualify for the job as well. It's about recognizing that and to work towards becoming in, and enabling yourself to be part of that boardroom conversation and uh, to also put your different perspectives on the table. And yeah, my my parting statement would be like, don't settle, challenge it. Lovely, Raise some very valid points and uh, that's a new perspective we have at the table and uh, thought provoking. Uh, Anupama, we have you back and we also have Chela. Uh, can we hear from you, Anupama, and then we can have Chela continue? Done. Apologies for this one. It was great all this while. <laughs> Anyways, so to just give a gist, I'll just uh, repeat the thing. Uh, I agree with Chela. Uh, regarding the fact that there should be a change in the mind, right? Um, and I'll give you a simple example of what happened recently. And because I'm a freelancer, there is no set, uh, what do you say, a boardroom or like a, a corporate structure that comes into picture for me. What tends to happen is that there are uh, opportunities and I have to place them, place myself or like have to, women have to place themselves in such opportunities. So recently there was a national level sport competition competition that was happening and to my surprise there were no female judges right there were only there were many female participants but nobody no woman judge on the panel so what I did was I reached out to the organizers and I said hey you have so many female participants you should have a female judge on the panel and uh, all of the organizers acknowledged it and most of these organizers and coaches and fitness entrepreneurs who are male, right, they want to empower women. But, you know, it was not the first point that came to a head, probably because of conditioning, probably because of the way it has worked so far in the society, right? So the next competition that happened, there was a female judge on the panel, right? So there was a change made. And I think that is a kind of, uh, you know, a change that we have to look at. And um, I think one more thing that one of my mentors pointed out, is that you have a common goal in picture. It's empire was a judge, some other lady was a judge. I think that competition needs to reduce and we need to look at the common goal. So when that happens, I think that's how we bring about change. Wow. So thanks, Anupama. We did lose you again in between. Um, but we got the gist of it and you're right. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Chela, can we hear from you now? Yeah, uh, I'm in the defense area, so hence there was a little bit of a challenge in getting the connection, but hopefully I think I've rectified. Uh, sure. So I was saying three things, right? Mindset change, second, or mind shift, second, the environment, uh, which has the uh, infrastructure and the uh, uh, culture piece. And third, I was saying about opportunities. I think if these three gets addressed in, in various whether it is an organization or society or in the country, that will uh, bring a balance to leadership. And I was saying it is not equal. There is a great level of imbalance across the uh, pyramid. Uh, it's, it's, we need to address our all levels because if we don't address the middle level and the bottom level, we can never reach the top level of, we are talking about the women in boardroom, boardroom, which can be addressed only when we start focusing right from the start and the middle level and then bring it, bring it to the board level. So I'll share more thoughts as we continue the conversation, but that's my initial thought. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi, thanks, Kajal, for that. I think most uh, of them have covered a lot of the points that I would have really thought about when we think about bringing change. But um, I think one of the big things that we need to do is understand why women drop off, right? Uh, and while we give the stand, stock standard answers about why women drop off, I think there is need to do a deeper understanding and think about it from 
the time you're in the education system. So you have women dropping off in the education system. So from school to college, how many women are dropping off? From college to higher studies, how many women are dropping off? From higher studies to jobs, how many women are dropping off? And if you see the numbers, you're, you know, you, so the numbers drop differently, right? From school to college, it's not that much of a drop, but from college to higher education, there is a larger drop. At, at entry levels, there is not so much of a challenge, but as you come into the middle and the higher, you see a lot of people dropping off. And very often I hear the same answers, right? There's not enough support in the system. Uh, women drop off because there are challenges, etc. But I think there are deeper seated issues which happen because um, irrespective of gender, there is always going to be challenges right? as you move up the ladder. Uh, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, there are challenges. They may be different. So A, let's understand the differences and acknowledge the differences. And yes, there are, I mean, there are challenges for men and there are challenges for women. So let's acknowledge the differences. But I think what we need to also do is understand the why behind women dropping off. Very often I hear very senior women say, you know, I just got fed up of fighting the system. Why did you get fed up of fighting the system is a question we need to ask. And what can we do to help you not get fed up of fighting the system is a question we need to ask. Um, and I think if we deep drive things deeper, we're likely to find different solves which organizations then can then put into play. Like it's not just about putting a crash in the organization, which is what they did in the early days, right? So, oh, early mothers should, won't leave if you give them support service, but that's not the, that was not the only reason why they dropped off, right? Elder care was another reason, but what could you do with elder care? Those are the questions we stop asking. So I think we do it at a superficial level. We need to start digging deeper. That's what. Um, I think the other challenge I'm seeing nowadays is because everybody's talking so much about it, the defenses have gone up at all ends, at the corporate end, at the individual's end, at the, uh, at the other gender's end, all of that. And I'm saying, is there a way, uh, Chala talks about opportunities. And I think for me, the big thing is, can you create opportunities to have open dialogue without having those defenses up and therefore giving the stock standard answers, right? Organizations are giving very straightforward standard answers, but are those really the answers? So let's break the defenses. Let's have really open conversations amongst ourselves, amongst women, amongst uh, you know, genders and with organizations. I think that's the second thing. And so for me, when you talk about environment, I think we need to make the environment safe for both or for all genders, like Pradna told me, right? It's really about us being able to open up and have very open conversations. We're all adults, we're all mature. Can we have those open conversations? And I think the third bit that we need to do is we really need to break stereotypes. We build stereotypes in our heads. Men are like this, women are like this, corporate men are like this, bosses are like this. It's just so much a stereotyping that we do. Um, so I agree with everything that the table has said, but here's my two bits to add. Absolutely. Extremely valuable perspectives. And clearly, you put a lot of thought to this in terms of uh, talking about it from, you know, with a different approach on different levels. Thanks very much, Shiva. Prerna, can we hear from you? Uh, for all those of you who just joined us, we are discussing what is it that we need to do to redesign our workplace, to reimagine a scenario that will have more women in both rooms. Yes, Prerna, and then we can have Yogita that present for us. Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me uh, talk about this very important and pertinent topic. Um, I think a lot has been covered already, so I'll try to bring a slightly different perspective. Uh, and I'll bring it from my experience, having worked in startups and scale ups for a for a long time. And what I have realized is um, majority of the organizations start talking about this issue once they reach a certain size and they start talking about this issue and then they put programs in place and, and no offense to anybody, which are diversity and inclusion programs. Right. And then they hire ahead of 
diversity and inclusion, whose job is to start changing the equation. You've already lost the battle, in my opinion, at that point in time, because this conversation needs to start the day an organization is conceived, the day the values and philosophy and objectives of the organization are decided. And, and one of the fundamental elements you need to have is diversity is not something that you have to do. It's something that that you need to do because otherwise you cannot achieve the objectives of your organization. If you have already reached a size of 200 people and at that point you're talking about how do I balance out people of different uh, diversities at different levels and boardrooms and all of that, that's a much bigger issue to solve than if on day one you say, actually, I'm gonna create an organization at every step of the way, whether it's the way I design my website, whether it's the way I talk about my mission, whether it's the products that I'm building or whether it's the way I communicate with my customer. And I'm going to be thoughtful about inclusion. And I'm being very careful about not talking about women and men because personally I have a very, because having lived in different parts of the world, I think I, I look at diversity in a much bigger way than a gender issue. I think it's a it's an issue of diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of viewpoints. I think unless you start thinking about inclusion as a fundamental part of how you will build your organization, you've lost the battle, right? It takes a significant amount of effort once you've reached a certain size to, to put in, uh, put changes in place. Now, I'm not saying it cannot be done because not every organization is a startup right now. Everybody, you know, we have big organizations, we have mature organizations, but I think the only way those organizations can really achieve what they want to achieve is not just having a diversity and inclusion program, but going back to the basics of what do they actually stand for and why do they want diversity and inclusion as part of their agenda. So I think in addition to everything what everyone has said, uh, because I think there's already some very valuable viewpoints around mindset, about opportunities, about internal battles, all of that. I'm not, I'm not challenging any of that, uh, any of those points. But I wanted to bring a slightly different perspective to it. Is I think, and given my experience, the startups where they have thought about it on day one are the more inclusive startups, and the ones where they haven't, they can have. N number of diversity and inclusion programs, the, the problem is exactly the same as you will have in an established organization. So that would be my two cents. Absolutely, uh, very profoundly uh, observed and uh, spelled out for us. Thanks very much, Prerna. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the problem only could have compounded in all those years to have reached a phenomenal size and stage. And then for the organization to start tackling it versus looking at it from the grassroots levels as to when you're starting out. So thanks very much. Uh, yes, Yogita, can we hear from you on what it is that you think we need to do to redesign our workplaces? So most of the points we already discussed. So in my view, it is a change in mindset at workplace is an important aspect. Like you no, know? so what happens like consciously, unconsciously, human being, human. I mean, human beings like you no know, look for direct or indirect affirmations from others. So when we get any success at a work, okay. So in case of women, like you no, know, such affirmations are generally less forthcoming. Either it could be the cultural uh, barriers, or we can say more on from no male female ratio at workplace so bringing that uh, encouragement to accept the diverse leadership styles basically women bring into workplace uh, will definitely help in changing the mindset so keeping it very short like no so along with policies rules and changing the mindset to support encouraging uh, support to support and encourage the leadership styles, mm -hmm. diverse leadership styles, it is irrespective whether it's a man is bringing or it's a woman is bringing. It it is much needed to redesign the workplaces. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughts, Yogita. With that, I'm quickly going to remind our audience that you are free to ask our panelists here any question you like in terms of your career, in terms of rising on it. Uh, in terms of their careers, if you'd like to hear an instant from, you know, one of their lives, then please post a question and we'll be happy to tackle it. 
Uh, in follow-up to the topic that we are discussing, there were a couple of questions and perspectives that we put in place. Uh, one of them being, what do you think are the obstacles that women rising are tackling internally, which is within themselves, and also externally in terms of workplace, family, society, culture, and how do you view uh, tackling these uh, obstacles? Maybe from a personal story point of view, maybe from the stories of the women that are in your lives, if you could share. Uh, would anyone like to take a stab at it? Yes, fair enough. I'll go first um, <laughs> so that others don't um, already cover the points. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think um, it's, as far as internal uh, challenges and obstacles is concerned, I think I think the biggest issue that women probably face, and I have personally gone through this journey, is thinking that I'm different and thinking that um, because I'm a woman, I'm at a disadvantage. And I think somebody already talked about this, right? Is it starts with, um, you know, by just by saying that you have automatically put yourself in a different bucket. You have, you have created that uh, internal, um, perception for yourself that because I'm a woman, I'm somehow different or I'm somehow less or I'm somehow disadvantaged. And I'm a strong believer, the moment you put that thought in your mind, everything you do, how you behave, how you interact, how you ask for things or how you don't ask for things makes it come true, right? Because your mind is a very powerful thing. Your subconscious mind is what drives how you interact with people and how people perceive you as individuals. So I think it starts with first putting this thought out of your mind that because I'm a woman, I'm different or I'm at disadvantage. You may be because we live in a society where the world is not fair. We, are, we don't like, live in a fully equitable world. You may be at a disadvantage, but don't put that thought process in your mind because then you won't even take the chances that may be coming your way or you won't challenge the chances which are not coming your way because you've already decided it's not for me so this self-selecting out and then convincing yourself that somehow the world is going to not give you those opportunities is where it starts I think that for me is the most important internal battle women have to um, you know they have to stop they're inflicting this battle on themselves they have to stop fighting this battle on their own. I think as far as external stuff is concerned, I think we've already talked about it. I think it starts with how we bring up our kids. I think it starts with, you know, why do we give pink to kids, to girls from day one? Why do we cover their rooms with pink and dolls and unicorns and Barbies and princesses? Why do we start there? I think it starts with that conditioning that happens from very, very early on that has to be broken, right? And I, I don't think it's an overnight uh, change. I think it's constantly having conversations like this and parents really consciously making an effort not to create any of those biases from the very day a kid is born, right? Let's stop having baby showers, which are blue and pink, right? Let's start there. <laughs> you know, let's start there because it will flow through the whole life of a kid. Um, and we are already creating that conditioning for them. For me. So that's that's kind of my perspective on that. Topic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think having having been a victim to this myself is, is that sometimes we don't even question it. You know, we've seen it, it's being done and we accept it to be the way to be without having wondered as to why. Why would why would you have blue for boys and pink for kids and just stick to it like a horse with blinders? Absolutely. Thanks, Prina. Yes, Pruvana. Yeah, I'll just add to what uh, Prina and you just mentioned, Kajal. I think it's the conditioning, right, that leads to that lot of self-doubt and in turn turns to that mental paralysis that, you know, women have or men have towards the women or society in uh, general. And then that leads to a lot of self-doubt in their ability and skills. So you need to be able to differentiate that. And I think also women tend to kind of have that 
uh, threshold that is defined by somebody else, right? They want to achieve what threshold has been put by others or achieve only till that point and feel very good about it. But I would say, you know, kind of break all of this and then create that self-defined threshold. What you achieve according to you is enough. You are enough. I think that is um, the most important emotion that a women can, you know, uh, celebrate with and be happy about uh, and, and speak up, right? I think that's one thing um, children are not taught, both men and, I mean, boys and girls, I would say this is going beyond gender. They're just not taught to speak up, right? They, you, you're always hushing the child and more the girl child. I think that needs yeah. to stop and that's when the whole thing is going to change. And there's an automatic assumption of rules. You know, I've seen this uh, with our the our mother's generation. And I when I see it continue, it really angers me. I think it's okay to be angry about that and express that anger saying, why am I being asked to get into the kitchen after a three-hour travel? Uh, whereas, you know, the other gender is okay to... It's changing. I'm not saying... I'm recognizing the change that is happening in a lot of our homes. But there is that automatic assumption. I see in societies, like, men will go do the, you know, collection of... Uh, uh, whatever, you know, towards maintenance or whatever, you know, very, very specific gender related role. Women will do the puja. It's as simple things as that that need to change. Uh, and women need to kind of bring themselves out of the conditioning, fight the conditioning. Yeah, absolutely, Bhuna. And as you say this, I feel like, sadly, we've become comfortable in those roles, you know, so many of us that we don't question it anymore. Uh, it's it's the norm, it's it's done, we know how to do it. It's going to take a certain stepping out of your comfort zone, learning the ropes of what is the other, you know, uh, what the other gender is doing. So are we ready to push those boundaries and get out of our comfort zones? Because hey, sometimes they say that's where the magic happens. I have four other women who have raised their hands, but I do want to quickly call on Chella because I definitely don't want you lost at this table, Chella. So just making sure that you're still here. And um, it would be nice to hear what your side of, uh, you know, are the challenges that men in the workplace are facing in terms of today we're trying to bring women at power with men. We're trying to tip the needles uh, equally, but what are the challenges that you face being on the other side of the table? Great. So I'm, I'm honestly not lost and I'm learning and uh, because as part of my role as well, I need to understand leaders' perspective from different industries and different countries. So it's very useful uh, to so, get different good perspectives. To know. Yeah. And uh, talking about, I have both views uh, in terms of my experience working with many different women leaders and women at home. And then, of course, my women managers, 50% of my 18 managers I've reported to are were women or women wow. because uh, it so happened. It's a coincidence. So probably that is why I'm sitting here. Then also got inspired by Kiran Mazumdar because that's where I started my career. The first leader I admired was the woman leader. So sure. that made me uh, the person who I am. But specific to your question, the, sitting on the other side of the table, uh, what uh, we see Personally, I'll take it as what I saw. There was a the level of unconscious bias was there for sure. If I say I was not biased, no, I was biased. And probably this is because of the conditioning. I think one of our colleagues was talking, mean, one of the speakers was talking about the early conditioning. So it also starts from where it stems from is also from the family. My biggest inspiration for diversity, equity, inclusion and being uh, coming out of bias uh, is my father. He taught me what not to do. I'm going vulnerable here, right? Uh, so he, and, and I won't blame him because he picked it up from his father. So I, coming from that family where lots of biases, then I took a decision that consciously I should bring it out. So sure. I've, I've not done it fully. So it starts from home. Then you live in a society where you tend to condition by the people with whom you are. So it's very important what kind of friend circle you choose. Then it goes into your organization, which you choose, whether it's a startup or or established organization. I happen to be in a startup because Biocon today is very established. 
but when it started, uh, I was one of the early employees of this organization. So it was an integral part of how Kiran and the leadership wanted to build this organization. So this, this consciously eliminating biases and, and disregarding these stereotypes and then creating a balanced leadership was very early in the organization. It was ingrained, but we didn't call it as diversity, equity, inclusion. We didn't call it as an initiative, but it was right. always, I think that gave me lots of insight to uh, uh, kind of internal force to change because you see around you, there is yeah. a big change. So that is what I experienced. I'm still consciously trying to be uh, looking for those unconscious biases and uh, the awareness is very high, very high level of awareness, but I call it as four years. <laughs> My recent framework I call one is awareness. Second is acceptance, right? A lot of time we are aware, but we do not accept it in terms of biasness. I'm talking third, I may accept, but I may do nothing about it. So third is agreeing to change, right? And yeah. uh, some, I may agree, but it's like a new year resolution. I may agree, but I may not do anything about it. Then the last, the fourth year is applying. So I'm in the application stage, applying stage, trying my best. And I, I also positively uh, influence my men around to see, uh, look at different lenses, because then you will get to see just not two genders, but the, all the diversity we are talking about. It's because diversity is larger than two genders. That was really amazing to hear and know from Jala and, you know, having seen it coming from a deep place of experience and authenticity, uh, we definitely, I'd like to uh, repeat what Bhuvna has said on chat and she said, it's very inspiring to hear that Jala, we need more Jalas for sure. All right. Um, yes. And let me address the women who raised their hands. So now let's hear from you. We were talking about what is it? What are the obstacles that women are facing internally and externally? For those of you who have joined us, I have about uh, 600 different folks here in India uh, who are all engineers. Sorry about that. No, that, that's okay. No, I was actually going to share something uh, quite uh, different. Somebody earlier spoke about this bringing authentic self to work and uh, the you know the even the cliched dni programs that Prena might have been referring to have this thing about bring your whole self to work so i'll tell you uh something which has been a personal challenge all along and i don't know if it resonates with anyone else now it is true that both in public life and otherwise we hold men and women to different standards and a lot of the stereotyping is also about that you know what is okay for a uh, when is it okay for a male leader to behave a certain way would we think the same had it been someone from the other gender uh, now for me the challenge has uh, always been and this is no exception I'm sure uh, uh, several of my colleagues or uh, you know people who have worked at different levels and then grown to leadership might have faced this is about when you do bring your authentic uh, self to work and you, you bring your whole self to work you're, you could either be the outspoken one, the one with, uh, you know, too much of a voice and opinion and therefore borderline difficult. You could be uh, uh, the rebellious one. Um, and uh, quite honestly, in my own experience, I don't see male colleagues being, you know, sort of held to the same for very similar demonstrable behavior. So, yeah, I know we have all spoken about mindset and the change begins from their mindset of women themselves men around but this is just something I wanted to share it's a challenge of a very different kind from uh, as compared to let's say coming from a household that's uh, restrictive it, it wasn't in my case so I don't have any of those to share I don't have children that I'm bringing up uh, so not much that I can uh, do there but the, this is in general you know about what sort of personalities what sort of public behaviors um, and when we do want people to bring their whole authentic selves to work are we acceptive uh, of the same, or do we hold, uh, you know, gen people from different genders to different standards? So, oh, a valid point. Yes, are we holding uh, people from different genders to the same level of accountability? Uh, as pointed out, as you know, something for us to take back and ponder on. All right, and let's hear from you, Vino. Uh, 
continuing all the same reasons which other speakers have already stated, I'll just uh, cite a very personal experience, which really made me, you know, give a second thought of what the situation is uh, currently. Uh, recently visited an exhibition which is uh, organized in Jaipur. Uh, it was from the infrastructure industry, which I represent. Fortunately, my husband, uh, he also came along with me. Uh, he's a medical doctor. Okay, so he had no clue about what was going on in that exhibition. And unfortunately, most of the exhibitors were only interested to speak to him rather than to me. Even I was the one who was asking the questions. I was the one who had queries. But most of them had a perception that, you know, he just because of men and women are, you know, they are there with uh, asking uh, like uh, at their uh, stalls. Men is the only one who would be at the, you know, at the be the forefront. You know, this really made me think that maybe are we still accepted as women working as not just leaders, but just as wo working women? I mean, you know, how people still don't accept that. I mean, they were not they were not ready to accept that yes, uh, I was one who was related to that industry, or I was the one who could actually get into a technical discussion with them. And he was just, you know, he was just a, a visitor there. You know, so yeah. probably this, we are still living in the same situation. <laughs> yes, well, these are, I mean, it is the stark reality and it does remind us of uh, to what levels the bias exists, uh, how deep down it filters. Um, and while it can be a play of society not being able to accept women or look at them, it could also equally be a misrep. And under representation of women, at these in these roles to be able to change that mindset as well so it's one feeding into the other uh is you know for that probably yeah, we still as... need more of acceptance and visibility a big yes. change in the mindset yeah. yes we need all hands on deck yes yogita let's hear from you okay i agree with most of the points what we have discussed so just taking the you no know, from the same level uh, there are certain times it, it's from my personal experience when i talk, i have seen myself and you no know, few of my peers or colleagues like women colleagues okay so most of the time we believe you no know, being a woman i don't need to talk about my work okay whatever the level excel i mean the excellent work we do uh, it will get noticed okay we don't do self promoting kind of and that's where you know, uh, it leads to not asking for that negotiate or asking for or the negotiating the uh, that well these are recognition rewards or maybe the promotion also okay because we we assume that okay i'm working i'm excellent i'm doing you no know, uh, excellent job you no know, in my day to day task or i'm just doing out of the going out of the way and doing something it will get noticed by the uh, either the stakeholders or the leaders or managers, whoever it's like, no, uh, involved in that process. And they will give that, uh, no, whatever the, if it is in the terms of reward or salary hike or maybe the promotion. So we just assume that and we just leave on that belief, no. So of course I came over on that along with, no, uh, taking the external help from the mentors, like, no. So of course that mentor, mentor, mentor mentoring part, has helped me to come over on that belief and started talking over okay i deserve this i need this you know? so yeah sometimes this kind of belief you no, know, they, they they just hold us back on okay whether should i go or not to go kind of so yes absolutely there's a lot that's holding us back voices outside and voices within and to constantly push those boundaries and you're right, uh, Yogita, it's not often that women really talk about what they do. Uh, one, I think, because they don't find it worthy enough. And two, because we don't really put ourselves out there. Yeah. Uh, when we do, it is such a feel-good experience that only goes back to nurture and feed what the good work that you've done to propel you into doing more. Um, yes, Nidhi. Uh, Nidhi, you're still on mute. Okay, sorry. Thanks, Kajal. Um, while talking about, uh, you know, what just Yogita mentioned, this reminds me of a very dear incident where I wanted to file for an award. And I reached, to, reached out to my manager saying that, hey, this is a women leader award. Can you please nominate me? 
because I think a quick reference um, with a little information might be really helpful. And after two days, after one week with the date, end date coming close, uh, close, he said, but leader is me. And that just left me shocked because you've given me all the right, uh, you know, you hired me. You brought me to the table, said that we need a marketing leader because the team is very, very male dominated. And being the only uh, women leader on the board, it was very surprising for me when the person who hired me said this to me. And pushing that, fighting that, and you know, coming coming back to home because I have a support system where which allowed me, you know, not to change my surname a decade back, which was the first fight to the society where everybody wanted me to change my surname after my marriage and my spouse supported me and said, no, let's not go through the paperwork and you are good because that's what your identity is. So with that little change, which probably I did not hold a lot of importance back then, but I realized that it is so very important because to, un to having the right partner who understand it's being about, you know, it's more important about being co-equal and then going back to work where I am being challenged of how do we look at organizational heroes? So when you, when you, you, you know, when I go back to my team and I realize when you, you know, you mention leader to them, it's always, you know, the male leaders that come to their mind. And that's exactly where I wanted to break or challenge that barrier saying that, you know, it's just not about you reporting to me or doing the job as a manager, but you can also look up to me for certain changes, for certain achievements and the certain way I conduct myself. So I think the whole, you know, while we've spoken a lot about mindset, but this example of how, about how we define a leader is very, very important because that's where, you know, although we are doing and trying to make that conscious effort at home, but there is a lot that needs to be done at work as well. Absolutely. And uh, let's hear from Anukama before moving on to our next question. Thank you, Kajal. Um, I think uh, one of the topics that we had explored, uh, explored as a part of the Herky, this uh, Herky, you know, workshops was the imposter, imposter syndrome, right? And that came across. That is something that I think a lot of the women leaders um, identify with, and it kind of overlaps with, you know, what Yogita said and. Or even what uh, Prerna said, uh, sorry, not Prerna, Nidhi said, right? And uh, that is, of course, an internal struggle. And there's always external struggles that comes in the form of, uh, you know, bosses, in the form of colleagues, in the form of sometimes even our uh, subordinates, right? I think uh, what I want to put out there is the fact that whenever I'm faced with these challenges, what has helped me is understanding that I am not the only person that's going through it. And there are many women who've already gone through it and, you know, uh, how do I put it, uh, oh, like overcome it successfully. And what really helped me was talking to them and understanding how they uh, reacted to such a incident, right? So um, I think like recently I spoke to one of the members from her pre club, Tanu, I spoke to my mentor. And that is why that's when I understood that the challenge that I was, uh, how do I put it, uh, uh, coming across was something that was uh, something that was already done. It was, I was not unique. I was not a, the only person that was going through it. And I think that is how we need to tackle with struggles uh, internally and externally, both whether it's either imposter syndrome or whether it's working with, uh, you know, people. So I think that is what I want to leave with. Sure. Absolutely, Anupama. And I think in uh, one of the panelists raised about speaking up, you know, which we rarely do. It's only when you speak up do you probably realize that you really aren't alone uh, in whatever obstacle you're going through. Someone's been there, someone's going through it right now, uh, which is the whole point of this uh, platform that we share together uh, to be able to know that you are not alone. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, I do have another question. I know there's one that came up in chat, which... We'll take up shortly from Ekta. But I did have another question and I'd urge uh, probably Rashmi and Sheetal to say something. They've been silent. Uh, 
it is we've always had perspectives of a male female ratio disparity because of the patriarchal norms that exist but is there also concern around women supporting women uh, what are your thoughts is it a valid one where does it stem from how do you think we will tackle it I don't know, do you want me to go first? Yes, go ahead, Shika. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak purely from a personal perspective. I, I don't think that there is a challenge about women supporting women. And, and I know over various conversations that we've had with her rising her key, et cetera, I've heard this uh, rhetoric quite often. I must admit, I've been, I've been extremely fortunate whether, whether I had male bosses or female bosses. I've had... Uh, my best mentors come from both, right? Um, so I think it's really, and I keep saying this, I think it's really what you, what do you make of the opportunities thrown at you? Or what do you make of the challenges thrown at you? Uh, that really defines uh, whether you're able to extract the most out of something, right? Uh, so you may have a tough boss, and but the perspective is understand what that tough, why is that boss so tough? Right, I had one of the toughest um, women bosses, but I cannot tell you how much I learned from her. I mean, a lot of who I am today is because she was so exacting in what she wanted uh, that at at the time, I'm sure I, I, I was like clearly bitching about her, right? When I was working with her, etc. But it's when you build a relationship and when you understand why they're doing what they're doing you suddenly realize that 90 percent of the time we've just misread the situation right and i think the bigger challenge is that as women we often don't go and ask and have that conversation uh, i keep saying this have the conversations because you may suddenly realize that they have a perspective which you never thought of because in your limited experience, in your limited uh, knowledge, in your limited working life, et cetera, especially when you're starting off in your careers, um, it it's very, you know, you haven't seen the worldview, you haven't seen the perspective, you haven't seen the pressures that they are going through. I, irrespective of the gender, I think that's one thing that really works. And I think if you work with people and you figure why things are the way things are, that's one. I think the second thing that I hear very often is how challenging it is. Nobody understands me, et cetera, et cetera. My, and I get it, right? I'm a mother of two. I've done careers. I've taken breaks. I've done all of it. But the point is that when will you step back and own that this is something you're doing for yourself? Uh, the day you own it is the day you will make the difference, right? Uh, you need to own. So if you want a career, own the fact that you want the career and own the fact that you will make certain sacrifices for that career and own the fact that there are compromises, right? Then don't put on the other hat and say, oh, my child and oh, my house and oh, my whatever, right? Own it. Own that this is a choice I'm making. I think ownership is extremely, extremely important. Ownership of what you want for yourself. And then things fall into place. And the third thing, and this is something I've learned out of my personal experience, is if you ask for help, you get it. Rarely does someone yeah. get it. Yeah. But you have to put your damn ego aside and ask for it. That's it. Ask. Husbands will support. I've seen fathers support, father-in-laws support brother-in-law support, friends support. I don't know how many men and women, I mean, all the women in my life have only supported me uh, because I, I wasn't ashamed to ask. I would say I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Can you help? Yeah. Some will give you advice. Some will not give you advice. Somebody will give you advice that you may not agree with. Somebody will give you a direction which you had never thought of, right? Decisions yeah. are yours, but ask. I think a lot of us don't ask. We're so scared of asking. And we are so scared of now, after having asked, not implementing what they asked for, right? So now the big challenge, oh, I asked my father and my father, and now they said it, but I'm not going to. That's fine. I mean, they'll, they'll respect me for that. So I think that's really the way I see it. I don't think it is about do women support women or not. I think that's again a bias we have decided to build. 
um, it's something about really putting yourself out there and saying, I need help. Can I get help? She may not help. Somebody else will help. How does it matter? Just go there and ask. Uh, I had a boss who once told me, saying, Poochne mein kya jata hai? Na bolenge na. Usse to zyada kuch nahi hoga. Absolutely. So if you put your ego aside, okay, nahi na bolenge. Kya farak pata hai? Just go and ask. And that's how I see it. Yes. Uh, and, and it actually comes from a, uh, this is not something that, uh, well, me or, you know, women around me have experienced, but that it I have heard this several times from women uh, in professional circles where they speak so much about, not so much the male bias, but the female bias. So in relation to our topic, which is, you know, redesigning workplaces when we redesign the work scenario, it it makes me think if this is one of those you know obstacles in our way which led led us to this question. Uh, Anupama, I know you have your hand up, but Rashmi, did you want to add to this? Do you have a perspective? Yeah, I think just from my experiences, Kajal, um, I have been fortunate where you know I've never felt in any of the work environments that I've that I've worked in where um, you know I've, I've never had the time to reflect to say okay is support coming from a male ally or female or gender right i think to me the bottom line is am i in a supportive environment right um, so, and, and i think that that has been in terms of you know at least my journey now different people can have different you know journeys and experiences for me that has been you know key um, and also being in organizations and teams and bosses which celebrate you for what you are, right? Um, like I, I do have a personality where, you know, I, everybody consistently tells me that I challenge status quo. I'm quite, you know, outspoken or I will ask all those questions. Like Sheetal says, my mantra has also been that kuch ne mein kuch nahi jata, right? So to max what is going to happen. And I think, you know, if organizations, irrespective of, I think, what gender, you know, whether it's a male supporting or female, it really doesn't matter. Do you have an ecosystem? Do you have an, are you in an organization where you feel supported, you feel heard? Um, and organizations also can have, you know, these different programs. And I think um, Prerna was also talking about it, you know, initially around. And I feel there is some structured programs you'll have, but I think the bigger thing that works to me is more a sense of tribe and community, which are those informal networks that you build, right? Um, so for example, for women, it would be nice that it doesn't have to be all structured. Do you have a forum where you can talk about life issues that you can talk about, that, that you, know, you might be facing, whether it's work balance life, whether it's you know, dealing with a demand. And those are all these, you know, I, I would say, it doesn't have to be like this big program that you're rolling out and you know, everybody's championing it. You have a sponsor, you have a committee and all of that. Surely that might be required sometimes, but I think how do you build that sense of tribe and community? I feel that works better. Like, can I go up to, you know, somebody outside my team also and can talk about, you know, what I'm going through or, you know, forums like this. Uh, I yeah. feel sometimes we get a little bit too hung up on just that structure. And is it formalized? Who's the sponsor? Who's driving it? Sure, those might be, you know, important too. But I feel the, the, the real connect, the emotion, the voice comes in the informal networks when you're able yeah. to make these relationships. So yeah. I, I would look at it like that. Yeah, absolutely. Very well, very well observed and pointed out. Thanks very much, uh, Rashmi. Uh, yes, Anupama, uh, what are your thoughts around this? Um, I think, I mean, I, I uh, agree with, uh, you know, what Rashmi said, uh, most of it. But I think I would disagree with the fact that, you know, uh, that it is not a harsh reality that women don't support women sometimes. We are often seen as threats by other women uh, in workplaces. And more so um, in a corporate setup, I'm not sure because, you know, again, I'm a freelancer, but in a freelancer, so it's always, you know, one coach against another, one entrepreneur against another, you know, there's always, uh, you know, that that goes on. And when you yeah. come together as a community, you know, there's always, there's always a sense of threat, right? So from my personal experience, I think uh, this can happen in three scenarios. One is when you have a boss 
who is not supportive and the other is when your colleagues are not supportive and the third is when your subordinates subordinates are not supportive right i think um, what when i came across this situation uh, personally was when i was trying to work with a women community to organize a, a meet up to empower more women through fitness but i think what happened was a the challenge there was that it was all coaches coming together and i think at the end of the day everybody was looking at each other as a threat like who would get more clients out of it who would get more uh, you know followers out of it and uh, the way when i spoke to my mentors you know what came there is to figure out and to ensure that you're not a threat to them if it's a boss mm-hmm. then putting boundaries in place and you know asking for help and probably that's where you know sheetal uh, mentioned asking for help and then they start stop seeing you as a threat and start seeing you as somebody they can help and there's a bond there whereas with colleagues i think it is to you know ensure that you're not in the league you you in the same league as them that you know you ensure that your bigger goal is to empower women is not to compete to get more clients or more higher salary or a higher whatever and with subordinates uh, i think it is just uh, this was another challenge that came in the you know community that we had a very problematic person who none of us was none of us wanted to work with but she was a woman and she was a part of the community and she was a part of the workout community so the way we overcame that is to give her a piece that made her feel included that made her feel like she had something to do and that again built a bond right so i disagree that there is that women uh, support women all the time uh, but there are definitely ways of overcoming it and i think that is something that we have to uh, see sure thanks so much uh, anupama uh, yes prema can we hear from you Yeah so I think uh, I completely agree with a lot of the stuff that has been said so far but I'm going to I'm going to be a bit vulnerable and share my own uh, experience and this is when I was uh, much younger and my own biases and I think a lot of women carry these biases so I think it's it's a bit unfair for us to say that everything is rosy rosy right so I remember when I was much younger when I had a female boss and she was hard on me I I looked at that experience from a very different lens than if there was a male boss who was hard with me right I will probably allow a male boss to get away with it a lot more than I would a female boss and I would carry that grudge why was she like that with me right so I had those personal biases not that 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 necessarily mean that they she didn't support me or i didn't support other women but there was this perception i had or there this conditioning i had was being a woman she needs to be a lot more um you know uh, she needs Soft to be more accommodating she needs to be less strict she needs to be whatever she needs to be right so i think we do we women do carry some biases ourselves about other women that doesn't necessarily mean it means that women don't support other women or they are trying to sabotage either, each other or anything like that but i do think that we expect other women to be nicer kinder more accommodating to us than we and then then men so we allow our male counterparts colleagues and other people to get away with a lot more than we would with other women so i think there are biases i think it's it's unfair to say there are no biases but i don't think that necessarily means that women don't they're intentionally trying to not support each other i think we we are looking at it from a different lens um and i think over the years i have realized my own biases and i've worked very hard at it but i don't know if everybody realizes those and are are courageous enough to talk about them so i think we need to all the women need to start talking about this as well great insights prerna thank you so much provana can we hear from you josh i this is one add to all these points uh, kajal i think it's all about it's very subconscious right what's happening around us and especially when women um, support or not support there is this very invisible reaction to this whole thing it's not most often it's not intentional right uh, what she was just referring to i think i was reading somewhere it's called the uh, power dead even rule and i believe the theory is that i'm saying i'm very consciously using the word the theory uh, is that uh, for women to women to forge a positive relationship i believe uh, you know everything has to be equal and you know must be kept dead even that's why it's called that and uh, the real test is when one woman raises about other or falls below the other and then 
testing happens and how they support each other or not support each other, that's when the whole thing comes about. And I think that's there. And also, I have witnessed this. I've not experienced this. I've witnessed women also have that. I have gone through this and therefore it's easy for you to handle this as well, right? So I've seen that behavior uh, that women put on and say like, I have come the hard way you can also do it like but they don't again it's very very subconscious like if i'm able to do this i'm able to raise children i'm able to uh, you know have a balance so why is this so tough on you is the uh, you know it's not even asked out but just the way they look at it or the way they respond to when somebody approaches them for guidance or uh, mentoring uh, women tend to kind of have that i've seen that happen and i've had to intervene and say that journeys are different and you need to help the other person with uh, what you've gone through, how you have gone through it and give them uh, better advice or even if you can't redirect them to somebody else, right? I think those small things can make a big change in the workplace for sure. And if women, I mean, we all know this, I mean, in the table and otherwise that when women come together, it's beautiful and there's so much more that can happen in the community yet. Uh, that's what we are all here for. And, uh, yeah, that's. I think it's. It can happen uh, if we are very lot more aware about how we react to situations and to other women. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that out, uh, Una. Uh, yes, Chala, can we hear from you? The so two points I'll summarize it quickly in the interest of time. One uh, from the. Uh, organization perspective, what we are looking at is creating an ecosystem for especially specific to women. I, I fully understand that diversity is just not women and men, but that's the big elephant in the room. And we need to address that. It is is the world problem, right? So our focus is to bring 50-50 by 2030, for which what we are doing is two two-step process. One, internally, how do we hire more women? And then how do we create uh, opportunities for more and more women to flourish in their career? And then how do we bring a balanced leadership across the pyramid, right? So until the boardroom level, so how do we grow? So there are a lot of initiatives around that, a lot of opportunities around that. But the fundamental problem is not after employees join, but how do we create an ecosystem where you get more and more women to join? We are in the field of science. So what we are doing is we have a program called Bench to Board, which is School Bench to Corporate Board. So we are going to school grade ninth and 10th uh, in an Indian education system, it's ninth and 10th is where you choose a stream. So we are, we want to inspire women in science. So we're going to ninth and 10th grade and talking to them about what are today's uh, science, yesterday's science and what bright science is there in the path for them. So that if they get inspired and choose science, 10 years later, they will join us or join any science company. But that's the kind of ecosystem we are focusing on. We call it as bench to board. So that's one thing I wanted to share. Second, for us, as whether men or women or all genders, what we need to do is uh, when it comes to uh, becoming uncon um, becoming unbiased and becoming balanced leadership, we need to do three things. One is I see, I feel, and most importantly, I do. What I see is what I uh, see around me. What I feel is what I experience. But most of the time, we leave it there and comment about it. But what I do, right? whether it is a male or a female, can I do something about it? And that the do is what will change our society, our organization, and our organization. That's my closing thought for today's session. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nidhi, I know you've raised your hand, but just in the interest of time, I'd like to also throw this question out, which was raised by Ekta. She wants to know, does gender-based pay gap exist at leadership levels and how can a corporate overcome it? Uh, Sumana, did you want to take a stab at that? We haven't heard from you in a long time also. Well, I mean, I, I think that there isn't universal data around gender pay gap while the problem does exist and uh, it, it's real. And it's across levels, not just uh, at leadership level, but a lot of it perhaps has to do with what Sheetan mentioned at the outset about, you know, where are these drop-offs happening? And therefore, just mathematically speaking, if you are going to have uh, uh, a data pool that is unequal, 
then it's very likely that the rest just uh, follows. I'm sure uh, those of us who work in big companies or in startups, mid-sized firms, I can't imagine any company that would put their hand out and say that, oh, we are not uh, you know, aware of this or this is not a problem and we are not uh, committed to uh, addressing it. Um, yeah. Transparency of uh, data disclosure is perhaps one of the first steps. And there, there is quite some ground to be covered. You know, is so, that data out there? Is this being communicated? Is there transparency on, you know, one of the sustainability reporting indicators is also about uh, equality of pay. And uh, of course, listed companies need to disclose it. Um, in Europe, it is one of the indices that you definitely sort of get measured on. Maybe not so much everywhere uh, else, but that's my uh, two cents. Does it exist? Uh, can one really sort of say that it, it doesn't? Uh, I'm sure uh, that's not the case today. But then it's a gap across all levels and also a gap that's larger than just pay. So, you know, I, I think pay sure. is an uh, element. Sure, makes sense. Uh, we do have two minutes. Yes, Nidhi, uh, what are your uh, thoughts on the previous question and also closing thoughts by anyone once Nidhi is done? Uh, on a very lighter note, while we were talking about, um, you know, the challenges and the external challenges and the way uh, women are pit against women, um, a lot of uh, role is media and advertising and how we put out stories to the audiences. We just wanted to bring a little, uh, you know, on a lighter note, the kind of Ekta Kapoor and the content consumption, uh, consumption that has been around for years has a very big play. So I know this is, uh, um, some might want to disagree to it, but yes, there is a lot that has penetrated through media and um, yeah. now the is changing. Absolutely. Uh, also adding to our conditions. Yes, yes, yes. So there is a lot, you know, while at organizational level and at work, you know, right at this table, I have great mentors and great friends who supported me during, through my transition period, be it Bhuvana, be it Prerna, be it you who came forward and helped me through the transition. Go take the plunge, explore, see, the home turf is always there to back you up. But the family front is where you fight the battle. And I, as I said, a lot of conditioning happens through media. So a lot of stories and narrative needs to change around there. And talking about the pay parity, ho, oh, trust me, there is a long way that the battle is still on. And uh, I, you know, we've been pushing boundaries. So let's see how would we, yes, there is a lot of, you know, miles before we sleep, especially on this question. Thank you so much, Kajan. Smitty, thanks for those um, thoughts. Uh, before, yes, Sheetal, uh, we'd like to hear from you. I saw you raise your hand and then it went away. So. No, no, so that was on the previous one. I, I actually like what, um, you know, was just mentioned by Nidhi on the whole media bit. But I think one of the things that women need to watch out for is don't buy into the story that is being put out all the time, right? So the challenge yeah. is that uh, there are multiple kinds of stories going out. I remember we were doing another discussion on, uh, and there was this reference to when women entrepreneurs go and pitch for uh, money versus when male entrepreneurs go and pitch for money, how different questions are asked, right? And my point is that there are, there's lots and lots of data being thrown out, but choose what you, what you think should be the data you want to kind of take in. Not everything needs to apply to everyone and not everything needs to become a part of your story, right? So awareness is great from a media point of view, uh, but I think not being influenced crazily about it is something that we all need to watch out for. I think we sometimes start believing our own shit and we start building our own barriers. like. Uh, Brenna said, you know, you've got to figure that you are different uh, or not figure that you're the only one who's different or whatever. You know, you need to start saying, what is it that I want out of my life rather than keep hearing people give you a story about, oh, women are treated badly or oh, women don't support women or, uh, you know, the 
the pay parity, uh, there is no pay parity and there is a huge amount of disparity. Point is, is that happening with you? That's one. And the second is like Challa said, what are you going to do about it if you figure that there is a pay disparity? That control is in your hand. Yeah. You can you can figure whether you want to fight for that pay disparity or not. I mean, that's totally and entirely. Now, don't hide behind it and say, oh, you know what? There is pay disparity. Therefore, I am being paid less. No, go out there and ask for it. I mean, let's not self-create issues also. I mean, for me, I think a lot of it, we hear, we listen, we discuss, and it just stays there. As women, we also need to go out there and say, I'm going to take charge of my life. I'm going to take charge of what I want to do and what I can fight for. And I think that take charge is very, very important. Don't let media uh, do that for you. Right. And with that, we have come to the end of the stable. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone, each and every one of you for being here. It has been an amazingly um, interesting conversation that touched points on very diverse perspectives. I'm so glad that uh, we could do this. Uh, dear audience, thank you so much for tuning in, for your comments, for your questions. We do have the awards, which will be starting at about 4.30. So come back and... Uh, Watch out for the women who are winning these awards so rightly. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We hope you have a great rest of the evening and a great rest of the event. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Kajal. You. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Kajal. Happy weekend, everyone. Thanks, Kajal. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.